This is breathing, inhalation. Remember, rib cage goes up, diaphragm goes down, volume increases, pressure uh, decreases, uh, air rushes in. The opposite for expiration or breathing out, uh, rib cage drops, diaphragm uh, relaxes and goes up, space gets smaller, pressure goes up, air travels out. Uh, this is again your thoracic cavity uh, in your lungs. So the thoracic cavity is lined with the parietal. The visceral is what lines the lungs and uh, it's super smooth and then there's this, this uh, fluid in between, right? To reduce friction, to create a suction um, and to even out pressure. Now, we, we in the past get something like this. This here with the heart inside and the lungs in place is called a pluck. I don't know where, why it gets its name, but essentially you're plucking out the trachea, uh, the, the, uh, the larynx, the lungs, sometimes the heart, and sometimes the diaphragm. And we usually get that. Every year we buy one. So we buy a couple for you guys to play with, or we get one and I demo it. We take the, um, that, that machine up there by the Stanley Cup there is a vacuum, and we, we blow air into it and we see it inflate. It's really neat, right? Uh, I probably won't be able to do it this year. Uh, but uh, I'll show you a video of it in a second. Um, and it's about the size of this table, about a meter. Okay. Now, the reason why we can do this is because uh, people find this a delicacy. You can go to Asian markets and you can ask for a sheep pluck. And the sheep pluck will be this whole thing, which some people will take certain organs out and eat it. Or they might use the whole thing, maybe as a soup or something, I'm not sure. Uh, but you can get a pluck. You can go to a grocery store or a uh, uh, you know, a meat guy, a butcher, and ask for a, a pig pluck, sheep pluck. You can even get a beef pluck. And one time we got a beef pluck, and it was, it was literally this big. And then when we blew it up, it was overflowing the table, the lungs. It was, it was pretty impressive. It was massive. Um, and again, we, we, uh, when you see that, it's, it's got this really slick layer over top. It's almost like um, cellophane uh, or saran wrap. Now, what can happen, though, is you can have a separation. So, you remember, this is supposed to uh, reduce friction, right, spread out uh, the pressure, but also create a suction. So that as the rib cage rises, the lung tissue inflates as well. And then when the rib cage falls, the, the lungs uh, compress as well. So it's kind of like stuck like a suction cup. Now, what can happen is that you can have this separate from the lung. It's called a pneumothorax. Okay, it's also known as a collapsed lung. So you might go, oh, a collapsed lung. I've heard of that in movies. So collapsed lung can happen a couple ways. One, you can have an infection, and there's a bacteria or something producing gas in that space, the pleural membrane space, and then the gap gets bigger and bigger as more and more gas is being made. The second thing could happen is that you could suffer a blunt trauma force. So someone hits you in the back with a, with a bat, or you fall down really hard, or you're standing around and there's an explosion. And what happens is you get knocked so hard that your, your lungs separate from the cavity, uh, from the uh, thoracic cavity. And why is that bad? Well, it's bad because the lung can't reinflate on its own. If there's air here and you inhale, where is that air supposed to go? It can't. So this lung doesn't inflate. So you're not getting any oxygen into this lung and there's no gas exchange happening. So if that happens, well, obviously, you're only getting, if it's that size, the pneumothorax, you're only getting 50% of your, your air in. So your blood oxygen levels would drop, right? Uh, your blood saturation would drop to, you know, below 100, which is your, what you want. You want around 100. So it could be 90s into the 80s. The other thing, too, is it can start putting pressure on your heart, and it can actually start squeezing the other lung. You could run out of air. One way to tell is obviously shallow breathing, right, chest pain, uh, but a shifting of your trachea. It would push everything over to the one side, and you could actually see your trachea being pulled to one side. This is an example of a closed pneumothorax. So this one could be caused by uh, infection and bacteria is producing gases, or like I said, so there was a big explosion or you're hit, and then the, the lung just separated. There is a, an example of something called an open pneumothorax. An open pneumothorax is where someone comes to show you his knife and then he stabs you. And if the person stabs you, 
Every time you inhale, air comes in. And you exhale, air goes out. Now, sometimes the hole, especially if it's like a knife, right, goes in, comes out, and it's just a little sliver of a cut. It could be a long sliver of a cut, but it's, it's narrow. So air will rush in because of the pressure, but it won't come out. So every time you inhale, air rushes in, 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 but not all the air is coming out. And what it does is start squeezing the lung again. Okay? So this is a problem. It's a medical condition, obviously. Right? You need to take care of it. And the one way we do it is we, we, we drain it. So you take a chest tube and you shove it into inside here. So if it's a spontaneous, uh, when it happens without a cut, it's called a spontaneous pneumothorax. We'd have to make an incision and put in a chest tube. If it's an open pneumothorax, we do the same thing. We shove it in there so that the hole stays open and then air can come out. Now, the nice thing about this is your lung will repair itself. Your lung can repair itself. We talked about, uh, you know, smokers that have smoked 15, 20, 25 years. If they stop smoking, uh, their lungs can repair themselves for the most part if they give it some time. Okay, some of it's irreversible, but, for, but, but, but your lung is uh, able to restore itself, as well as the pleural membranes. Okay, so once we recreate that, we get rid of the air, we can seal it up and let the lungs heal. Uh, here is a, here's a picture, a series of pictures of a doctor fixing it. So this person right there probably got stabbed in the chest or something. A doctor has shoved his finger in the hole to plug the hole so not, no more air rushes in and the lung keeps collapsing. Then the person has traded his finger for a, a tube, which uh, uh, the doctor has, uh, he or she has sutured in there, tied into place so that it can drain of air over time. And then eventually, if it's a bacterial infection, they'll treat it with antibiotics. If it's, if it's uh, you know, uh, spontaneous for no reason, or it's an open pneumothorax like this, they'll let it drain, and then they'll suture it up and then seal it off so that it, it can't, uh, no air can flow in and out. So that's called uh, pneumothorax. Now, a control of breathing, you need to breathe about 10 to 20 times a minute. Okay, so every 60 seconds, you're breathing 10 to 20 times. It uh, depends on you know, how relaxed you are. depends on uh, what you're doing, your activity. Uh, newborns, if you watch a baby, their chest goes up and down really fast, almost one time per second, really fast. And then over time, it, it, it lowers and lowers and lowers. Uh, the total lung capacity, if I was to take out your lungs and, and, and fill it up with air and then measure how much I could squeeze out of it, it'd be about six liters. So that's uh, three soda pop bottles, the two liter bottles. That's how much air you can, you can inhale and exhale. Um, now, when you sit here, just resting, watching this lesson, you're moving about half a liter in and out. Okay, if you're normal and you're healthy, right? Half a liter in and out uh, as, as we just sit here. That's called your, your tidal volume or your resting volume. Now, when you breathe in, you have these sensors in your brain. It's called your medulla oblongata, MO. It's a part of your brain that has blood going to it. Every single... Uh, tissue in your body has to have blood going to it. You guys know that, right? To get nutrients, to get oxygen, get rid of waste. Uh, well, the medulla oblongata happens to check the chemicals in the blood as the blood goes to it. It has chemoreceptors. And what it's looking for is it's looking to see how much carbon dioxide is in the blood and what the pH of the blood is. And if these are out of whack due to exercise or, or, or whatever, or sickness, right? It will uh, tell through electrical impulses your diaphragm to go faster and deeper, right? Your brain, your medulla oblongata, which is the control center of breathing, will say, hey, you got too much carbon dioxide or you have too much acid in your blood. Start breathing deeper and faster, okay? So increase the rate and depth of breathing. Here's your medulla oblongata. It's right there. See, it's oblong right there. Okay. This is the very primitive part of your brain. That's your higher learning or higher functioning part up there called your cerebral cortex. So this stuff controls things like your eye movement, your breathing, your digestive system, the really basic stuff. And that thing there, the medulla and, and the bit of the pons, will actually measure carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions and tell you to breathe faster and deeper if you have too much carbon dioxide or, or acid. There's a second method, too, in your, uh, your aorta, 
and your carotid arteries, the arteries that run up and down your neck. This is your, called your aorta, and this branches off your heart. It's the major blood vessel that carries oxygenated blood from your, your heart. It's really big. And it has chemoreceptors in it that also measure for, in this case, low oxygen. Not high carbon dioxide, but low oxygen. And if that's low oxygen, it'll send a signal to your brain, your medulla, and say, hey, we're, we're low on oxygen. Can you tell the diaphragm to breathe faster and deeper, please? And it will. Okay? But the principal way of managing it is through the brain, the medulla. Uh, this is a secondary method of controlling it through your uh, aortic arch or your carotid arteries, the ones that run up and down your neck, the ones that you can feel that, go, uh, that have a pulse. Now, breathing out is purely by stretch receptors. The little bundles of grapes at the bottom of your lungs, as they fill up, they have a point where they go, we're really well stretched now and they signal to your medulla to stop sending the signal to in inhale. And it relaxes everything and you exhale. Okay? So, inhibits the message sent to the medulla oblongata and it initiates uh, expiration. Now, the last thing I want to chat about, you guys are uh, quite fortunate because we're a little bit ahead of the other block, but uh, it's just all these turns about airflow. Uh, we used to do a lab where we get these devices, so I have a whole bunch of machines to measure how much air is in your lungs. Uh, your resting volume and your forced inhale and forced exhale. Here's one machine. It's just got this little dial and you blow into it and it turns the dial. Um, and I have another one here which you breathe into. It's a medical grade one that, uh, that we won't get a chance to use this year. And we can't use it for obvious reasons, right? Because um, can't find it. COVID is, is it, it, you know, can be passed th through air droplets, so we're not going to do it. But, and we used to graph all of this stuff. So you guys are fortunate. We don't have to graph it this year, but we do need to talk about the terms. So the first term is tidal volume. That's you sitting here and your diaphragm moving up and down. You probably don't even feel it. It's how much air is moving in and out of your face right now. And that's about half a liter. Expiratory reserve. If I ask you to breathe out and stop, is there more air to breathe out? Yeah, there is, right? If I just, like you're doing, breathe, you're shallow breathing in and out, and you, you shallow breathe out, shallow breathe in, shallow breathe out, I say stop, shallow breathe out. Now keep breathing out. You could push out more. That's called your reserve volume. You can breathe out more. Okay, how much can you breathe out more? Probably like a, a liter or two. Inspire, inspiratory reserve volume, this is the opposite. You're breathing in, shallow breathing in, shallow breathing out, shallow breathing in. I say, okay, now breathe in more. You can breathe in more, right? That's a big breath in, right? That's called your inspiratory reserve volume. Now, if I add all of that up, I add all of the air you can breathe in and then measure how much you can blow all the way out, that's called your vital capacity. That's how much air your lungs can hold while you're alive. Because your lungs never deflate, right? So it has this residual volume. So as it sits inside the body, it always looks like that. Inflated. But we can inflate them more, and we can inflate them less, right? And that would be called your vital capacity. So the amount that lives in here, just as you're standing here, because you're a, a, a living human being, uh, is called your residual volume. Now, if you pass away and you donate your body to a and 12 we could potentially take your lungs out and fill them up with air using a vacuum cleaner. And then we could hook it up to a machine and then roll them flat. And we could sig figure out what your total lung capacity is. Total lung capacity can be only determined when you're dead, right? Or we can estimate how much air is in there. But, but uh, you, we can't test for it. We can't test it using a machine. The only thing we can test using a machine is your vital capacity. How much air your lung can hold without collapsing. But if your lungs could collapse, that would be your total lung capacity. Okay? So those, we used to graph these, and when you watch the video for this, you'll see the graph. And we'll talk about the graph, where the, bar, the lines are and stuff. 
but for us this year, uh, just enough to know what tidal volume is, what vital capacity is, and what total lung capacity is. Ready? Okay, let me find the last video. I just wanted to show you a, a video of the lungs being inflated. So uh, we'll just go and uh, what would it be? Beef pluck lungs inflate. Oh, that's a good Google search. Yep, knew it. Okay, it's not gory. They're pink, but here we go. There we go. Sheep lung, not the big one. This is what we would usually get for you guys if we had, um, if we had, uh, you know. Well, I've actually got some collapsed animal lungs in front of me. So All right, here we go. The lung here and the lung here. So this is a pluck. That's a trachea. Now, usually what we do when we go to the, um, the, the butcher, we say, hey, can we have it dirty? So dirty means that it hasn't been cleaned up. So you would have the larynx maybe still there, like this giant larynx. And you'd have the trachea. Here are the two lungs, left and right. There's the heart. And then sometimes you would still see the muscular flap of tissue called the diaphragm still. Okay, so this one's a little bit more clean than the ones that we would want. This is uh, fresh, it's not been preserved. If it was preserved, it'd be all brown or gray, and it would inflate, right? This is still f fresh. And of course, here's the, here's the heart. In There's the, the heart. You can see the coronary arteries going. You want me? The, okay. The surface of the heart. So those are the blood vessels that feed the heart. So that's the slick pleural membrane. You, you remember I said it, it looks like a saran wrap on top? And so that's the uh, pleural membrane. And then there'll be the one on the inside of the rib cage too called the, pleural mem uh, the visceral membrane, sorry. And those two rub up against each other and they're super slick, right? Decreased coefficient of friction, right? Really low coefficient of friction. Uh, and a little bit of a fluid in there to keep the friction um, uh, as well as decreasing pressure points as well as creating a suction. Imaginates the surface of the lung, increase the volume of the thorax, reducing the pressure, and the lungs would suck and fill up with air, and it would fill the complete expanse of the thoracic cavity. So here you can see the lobes. Okay, so your right side has three lobes, and your left side has two lobes to make space for the heart. From this we can see it's a very thin, but it's also a very tough membrane, visceral pleura. Going over the yeah, you can see it right there. See it? It's like a, a saran wrap laying over top of it. These lungs are dead. They're okay, he's going to inflate if them. Look at this trachea. We zoom into that. Oh, we can see he's got a camera. That there's rings of cartilage, and I can feel the rings of cartilage underneath my fingers there. Because the esophagus would be immediately posterior to. Is he going to inflate them or not? We call it a trachea. He calls it trachea. And you can see from the bubble here that I've blown up the endotracheal tube within the trachea. Oh, he expanded it. I can deflate the endotracheal tube. Here we take it. So that is the tube. That's an uh, uh, endotracheal tube. So when, when I... You remember that procedure where they cut down and then they use a, a cauterizing blade to cut, cut, and then uh, expand it, and then cut horizontally? What you do is you shove a tube down there. But because you don't want the tube to move around, it has a balloon on the end. So you shove the tube in and then you pump up the balloon and it holds it in place, right? So the balloon expands and holds it from moving down, which could damage lung tissue, or out, right? And then you wouldn't have a way to breathe anymore. So that's what he's doing. He's just showing you how that thing works. Take it out. It's deflated on the endotracheal tube. See, that's what it looks like. And that means if the patient is to vomit, the vomit can't get past this blockage, this blown up balloon, but the air can get in and out of the balloon up. Okay. Now I'm just fitting, fitting an ordinary bag to this uh, endotracheal tube. Okay. So, so now he's going to bag it. Inflate. And then when I let go, the lungs deflate. 
Now, why are the lungs deflating when I let go? Why is the default position of the lung to be collapsed? <laughs> I'm not doing anything there, it's just collapsing on its own accord. It's breathing out and collapsing on its own accord. Why is this? You hear the wheezing? Well, as we mentioned, the wheezing is coming out of these cuts. So when the, per the butcher removed the lung, he, he probably nicked the lungs all over the place. It happens all the time. So when we get our, our lungs in, they're always nicked. And then when you f inflate them, there's always a leak somewhere. And I think that's what's happening with his. In the lung, there are millions of individual alveoli. And I have one alveoli here, which I'm going to blow up. Oh, OK. This is a greatly enlarged alveoli. Just a balloon, man. Okay, let me see if he Not blows enough. it. So it's interesting to think that all of the time, in you right now, all of the time, you can see that one, because there's a visceral pleural membrane on top of the surface of the lung, and because there's a negative is... I want to see him blow it up. What we need to do is take measures to reinflate them by reintroducing a negative pressure between the two pleural membranes by taking the air out from the two pleural membrane. So this is the actual bag that we would use as a paramedic. So that, that's, uh, so you rest it on your thigh and you push it down with your full, your flat hand. And, and that's what you're using to intubate someone uh, on a scene, right? Usually you don't want to do mouth to mouth forever because that takes too, uh, too much work. And if you don't have oxygen, a supplemental oxygen or a mask or a respirator, you can't do it. You can hook this up to pure oxygen though. There's a little valve here. You plug in your oxygen there. So when you intubate them uh, using that thing, uh, you'll be pushing, you force pushing oxygen into their lungs. Yeah. Looks like, looks like the back of a chicken. And that's the, that's the esophagus. So the esophagus runs down past the lungs, down past the diaphragm into the stomach. It's kind of funny, Bill. Yeah, let me just see if I can find one last one where he fully inflates it. inflating beef lungs. Someone's got to do it. Oh, here we go. Check it out. Oops. So look how flat and collapsed they are. It's because the balloons inside the alveoli are just laying flat right now. That's one hairy grade 12. Look at that guy. Yeah, you can see that's the larynx. That's the voice box. You can see how solid it is. And you can see it actually the vocal cords there, right? They, they look like, they actually look like lips and he's gonna push past them with that tube. There you go. Watch how big they get. It's, it's quite surprising. Look how big they got. Now when you feel that, it feels like a really hard balloon. And then when you, you squeeze it, you can actually hear popping. Like when you pop uh, the, the bubble wrap. And what you're doing is you're popping the little alveoli in there. It's, it's, it's got a really neat texture. Look how big it got. Yeah, see, you talked about the bubble wrap. So three lobes on one side, two on the other. That's a lobe. There's three. One, two, three. And then that one's coming from the other side.
There you go.